We've got tales of bears, roommates, and princes, and all that is coming up next. Welcome to episode 282 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Jeff Adams, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello. This podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. Thank you to LOL, Joy, Sob, Facepalm, and Rocky for recently joining us. If you'd like more information about the bonus content we offer our patrons, go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Yes, welcome to our new patrons, and hello to you, Rainbow Romance readers. We are so glad that you could join us for another episode of the show. Before we get into this week's reviews, we'd like to tell you about another show that's part of the Frolic Podcast Network. This one is from someone who's been our guest on the show a couple of times. Here's Sarah Wendell from Smart Podcast Trashy Books. She's going to tell us a little bit more about her show. Well, hello there. I'm Sarah Wendell from Smart Podcast Trashy Books, part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Smart Podcast focuses on romance fiction, the nifty folks who read it and write it, and always what books we're reading and want to tell you about. It might be an expensive podcast to listen to, but I promise great recommendations and conversations every week. We have talks about burnout with educators like Amelia and Emily Nagoski. We have gossip sessions with authors like Nalini Singh, and we're always having a good time, and I'd love it if you joined us. New episodes arrive every Friday, and you can find Smart Podcast Trashy Books on your favorite podcast app. We've done a whole bunch of reading in the early days of 2021, and so we've got a whole bunch of reviews coming up for you. I want to kick it off with Roommate. Of course, Serena Bowen was our guest earlier this week, and now I get to tell you everything that I loved about this book. Now, Serena's hockey romances are among some of my all-time favorite books, and wow, has she scored big time with Roommate, an MM romance that's set in her True North universe. There's zero hockey in this book, and I didn't care one bit, because the story of Kiernan and Roderick grabbed my heart, and it would not let it go. I suspect this book is going to end up and be part of my Best of 2021 list. Full disclosure, I read this in December, and it would have been on my 2020 list had the book actually come out last year. Kiernan is a man of many, many secrets. Secrets upon secrets, I would say. And in some ways, they are his shield, and also they are the baggage that actually keeps him from living a full life. He's also a people pleaser. He's determined to do what he feels is the right thing in every single circumstance, even if it makes him miserable. Now, Roderick, on the other hand, has just moved back to his hometown after a really nasty breakup. He's initially living in his car due to some very crappy parents that he's got, but he starts to get his feet under him getting a job at a local coffee shop that needs a baker. And boy, does Roderick bake. My goodness, this book has a little bit of food porn going on in it with the breads and pretzels and bagels and other pastries that Roderick makes. But guess what? Kiernan works there too. Now, Kiernan and Roderick both have history because they went to the same high school. As they see each other at the bakery, they each catch the other's interest. And yet at the same time, they know it's not something they could focus on in that moment. But no worries, though, because they're about to become roommates. Once Kiernan discovers that Roderick is sleeping in his car, his instincts to do the right thing kick in, and he cannot leave him out in the cold. This roommate and working relationship starts in a lot of ways as enemies. They're not at all comfortable with each other, if for no other reason than Kiernan's introvert self does it mix with Roderick's extrovert. Roderick is far too playful for Kiernan's comfort. As they settle into being roommates, though, sparks of friendship develop, and they figure out how to be around each other. And then, like I said, there's the food. Kiernan loves Roderick's cooking. And that Roderick's willing to teach him how to cook is really how these two start binding themselves together into this relationship. This book really soars as Kiernan figures out how to open himself up and become his authentic self in so many ways. And he also figures out how to say no sometimes and go for the things he really wants. It's so incredibly sweet. It's not easy And boy, though, once the secret starts to fly in this book, it's pretty incredible how much Kiernan's actually kept up to keep people, quote unquote, comfortable. Now, Roderick's got his own baggage, too, not the least of which was being with a guy who was, in fact, closeted, a a, a semi-famous country singer. Roderick settling into his new groove is another great component to this story. Roderick and Kiernan found each other at just the right time for themselves, and when they're not butting heads, they're actually a really great team. It's, it's so wonderful to see them kind of move into that aspect of their relationship. 
Now, as I mentioned in my interview with Serena, I really loved how this book presents religion with Father Peters. It was great to see how the father talked with Roderick and helped him through uh, a few things to help him kind of see how he and Kiernan could actually move forward together. I really adored where Roderick and Kiernan ended up and how the book wrapped up everything, even some of the most challenging elements of it all. Most of all, I love how it set up the Vino and Veritas series. I'm excited to dive into those books when they start rolling out. So thank you, Serena, for kicking off my year with a really wonderful read that was just full of memorable characters. And again, if you missed the interview with Serena, just go back to episode 281 and check that out. Well, this past week, I had the great pleasure of reading The Uncut Wood by Slade James. Now, Slade appeared here on the show a couple of episodes back in our Winter Wonderland giveaway episode. And The Uncut Wood is actually the introduction to his brand new Bear Camp series. And it's the story of Hank and Gunner, two lumberjacks, at a seasonal campground, the Bear Mountain Lodge. And they're going to be competing in something they've decided to call the Jack Olympics, featuring various feats of sexy lumberjackness. (laughs) I would totally go to those games. (laughs) Hank decides that now is the perfect time to finally admit his feelings for Gunner. But just before they compete, he kind of chickens out, and instead his competitive streak wins out, and he makes a bet. If Hank wins, then Gunner has to go on a romantic date with him. They compete in an event to show off their dexterity with an axe, a log-splitting competition, and by the end, it's apparent to everyone that Gunner, the superior axeman, lets Hank win. That evening, Hank takes them through a section of the forest called the Uncut Wood, along a path to the most remote cabin on the property, which he sets up for their romantic date. And there they eat, and they talk, and they make love in front of the fire. It's all very sweet and very romantic. And both of them are finally able to admit that they've been interested in each other for a long time, but weren't really sure how to go from friends and colleagues to something more. This story at its heart is really a perfectly executed friends-to-lovers trope, and I loved it so very much. If this is an indication of what the rest of the series holds, I am 100% all in. If you did not pick up your copy of The Uncut Wood in the Winter Wonderland giveaway, don't worry. Slade James has you covered. It's going to be available on January 15th. And not soon after that, Grumpy Bear, the first full-length novel in the Bear Camp series, will be available. And that's coming January 28th. I'm really excited for Slade in this series. I'm so glad you liked that first one. I'm eager to read it myself. So back in episode 279, I reviewed the first two books in the Rosavia Royal series, and I mentioned that I was already into the third book. And now, just a week and a half or so later, I have finished the other three books. And I have to say, I loved every moment I spent with the princes of Rosavia. Now, book three in the series is Zoe Dawn's Throne Together, and it is a wonderful second chance romance between two princes. Prince Julius of Rosavia and Prince Dante of Thedes. The neighboring countries had once thought there was going to be a, an arranged marriage between these two children before they were born. And then when it turned out that they were boys, the monarch still kind of threw them together. And through their school years, Julius and Dante were inseparable. The people and the press just adored these two princes. But then while they were still at school and on the verge of finishing up their education, uh, they actually took what had been to that point unmentioned passions a little too far. And they felt that they ruined the relationship and they ended up not speaking for four years. But now as the royal ball approaches, Dante has actually got diplomatic duties in Rosavia and it throws the two princes back together again. And as you would expect, their friendship and passions begin to spark. Zoe's a new-to-me author, and I really love how she handled the second chance here. The moments of tentativeness between the two princes as they kind of, you know, start to circle around each other again. And then there were times when it was like they were never separated and just kind of back to their old ways. And it kept popping back and forth like they felt like they took it too far and then they pulled it back again. It was really a delicious kind of dance between the two as they were getting back together with each other. And they were very cautious, these two, not to go too fast with their passions at the same time because they didn't want to make the same mistakes over again. There's a little undercurrent of something else happening here, too, because it turns out that Dante's father is actually trying to engineer an embarrassment to Rosavia during the ball. A whole bunch of stuff comes out. Both of the princes are furious. They don't quite know what to make of it. Julius is really hurt because he's not sure what Dante's involvement in all of it has been. 
This mix of a little political intrigue and conflict with the princes is really an interesting kind of external conflict that works its way into the book that I really, really enjoyed. But at the end of the day, there's like magnets that are just drawn to each other. Because even while they're hurt and they're not sure what's actually going on here, they they want to come back to each other. They want to talk about it. They want to sort it out. It was really just brilliantly done, and I loved it to pieces. And it all comes together in a really perfect ending that sets things right, not just between the princes, but between the countries as well. Some of the stuff I really enjoyed here was around Dante and how he viewed Rosavia. It turned out that even in his unconscious all this time, when he was painting, because he's an artist on the side as well, he was actually painting some very Rosavian things, and it was being back in the country that kind of brought that back to him and his love of being there and his love of Julius. It was just, it just made my heart so very happy. So I really enjoyed that installment of Rosavia. But I have to say that it's book number four in his court by Max Rowan, who's also a, another new author for me, that was my favorite of the five because this mixes two of my very favorite things. There's the continuing royalty trope that's in play here, but this is also romantic suspense because here we find out that Prince Benedict is, in fact, a spy. Everybody thinks Benedict has a very playboy lifestyle while he's in the army. All of his brothers believe this to be true, but only Benedict and his valet actually know what the truth is, that he is a spy who is out there doing important work to keep Rosavia safe. And the current mission for Benedict is to figure out who has stolen the crown jewels and actually recover them before the royal ball. Because to not have the all-important jewels on hand at the ball would be a disgrace for the country, making everybody wonder how on earth Rosavia can protect itself if it can't keep uh, an eye on the actual crown jewels. Nobody wants this huge scandal, of course, so it's up to Benedict to save the day here. Now, Benedict gets thrown together with a young analyst named Felix Wright. Felix is a genius, but he's had no fieldwork experience. He's very happy behind a desk working on whatever analysis agents need. He works on technical projects, but he has never, ever considered himself field material. But the requirements around the mission to recover the jewels means that Felix needs to go out with Benedict into another country to get the information that they need. This is such a brilliant enemies to lovers piece. Felix wants nothing to do with the prince. He barely contains his disdain for Benedict and the procedures that Benedict uses to actually get the job done. Because he's one of those agents who will just do whatever it takes, potentially throwing out the rule book and pushing the boundaries to get the job done. Now, Benedict, on the other hand, <laughs> he's a little bit of an imp here uh, and very mischievous because he can't resist pushing Felix's buttons to fluster him. Uh, I really loved how their relationship pivoted over time between some of the angry barbs that Felix would throw at the prince versus the playful jabs that Benedict would toss out and then how that pivoted over time to where Felix also became even more playful. It was such a delightful chemistry between these two. And, oh, did I just love the mission itself. I love good romantic suspense. I love getting down into the nitty-gritty details of how they're going to recover something. And Max really balanced the mission and the information and the action around that with the growing romance between Benedict and Felix so perfectly. Forced to travel and work together, they had all the time in the world to get to know each other. And even a little bit of time as they had to wait for certain things to happen to allow some of the romantic elements to flourish. One of the things that's always a balance in romantic suspense is dealing with the danger involved while also having that moment to take a breath. And again, Max just made this all flow together so, so well. In particular, I really loved how Benedict handled helping Felix gain confidence in the field. It wasn't all fun and games, and Felix really needed to feel like he was ready to be in the field, could execute the job that he needed to do, which even involved adopting other personalities. Very often they were in a very Mission Impossible way, they had a, a way to manufacture masks on the scene to become someone else with the hair and the makeup and the contact lenses and everything. And that was so far out of Felix's experience that I really loved watching him go through that as well. 
all of this ends up back at the palace for a very intriguing game of cat and mouse that runs right up to the start of the ball. It was just brilliant. And of course, you know, this whole story has to come back to the romance too. And Benedict and Felix have the sweetest turn from enemies to lovers, especially as they wonder if they're going to make it through this mission because at every turn, the danger just keeps building up and they really have to wait just a bit longer and then just a bit longer and a little bit longer to figure out and really make that final resolution towards love. I, I just loved every single minute of it. And now we're to the fifth and final book in the series. It's called Barely Regal by E. Davies. This book focuses on the youngest prince, Renford, or simply Ren, as he likes to be known. He's 19. He's both eager to grow up and assume his royal duties, but he's also still got a fair amount of what he willingly calls the bratty teenager in him as well. Ren isn't happy when the duty he is assigned by his mother and father is commander of roses because he doesn't see it as, a, as being as important as the duties that his older brothers have. Now, Tom Pierce is Ren's valet, assigned to keep the prince on schedule and in line and doing what he needs to do. They've worked together for years, and now both of them are feeling there could be more to their relationship. There are many things in play here. There's an age gap romance, as Tom is 16 years older than Ren. There's the difference in station between them, of course, because one is a royal and one is the valet. There's also some daddy kink involved here as Rin desperately wants Tom to dominate him, far more than just keeping him on a schedule. Ed does such an incredible job with the push and pull between Rin and Tom. It's a delicate balance they have between being prince and valet and then simply being Rin and Tom. And those moments as they get into more of the, let's say, familiar way of being around each other when they can kind of leave aside uh, that prince valet side of their relationship is so tender and just wonderful to see happen. Tom is a stickler for protocol, though, especially given an incident in his past, which comes to light a little later in the book. I tell you, Rin's bratty side really brings out the dom that Tom has kept put away for many years. I really loved how these two moved from kind of the tentativeness uh, of what this relationship could be to really getting what they both want. Ed ratcheted up the tensions perfectly throughout the book. Now, this story is also a bit of a coming of age for Ren as he settles into his duties. While he doesn't like the job he was given, he sets out to do it with some guidance from Tom and also some guidance from a really wonderful head gardener. He actually finds over time that he enjoys this work. And even more, he discovers how important the roses actually are. They represent not only the royals, but some of the other founding families of Rosavia. And his job includes creating new breeds of flowers for new members of the royal family, such as the man that Prince Leo will announce his engagement to at the royal ball. And for the people of Rosavia, the flowers, actually being able to grow the flowers of their favorite royals or maybe the entire family in the yards allows the people of the country to feel closer to the royal family. And as Ren discovers all of this, he sees that he can really have a penchant for it. And by the time the ball comes up at the end of the book, he is really into making sure the flowers are right, creating the right flower for Leo's soon-to-be husband. One last aspect I want to call out here is how much I love how Ed managed the family conversations that happened here. Uh, there's a, a conversation, obviously, with the king and queen that Ren has to have about the ramifications of having a relationship with his valet. But there's also a conversation that happens with Tom's family as well, because there can certainly be repercussions on them as this relationship starts to unfold, because it's more than just a royal, perhaps, starting a relationship with a quote-unquote commoner. So while book four in this series, In His Court, was my favorite, I really highly recommend all five books in this series for just a great escape to another place with some really wonderful characters and the opportunity to explore so many different character types and tropes too. It was really a wonderful, wonderful read. And as they say in the series blurbs themselves, I can see where you could read these in any order. I did read them in the recommended reading order, but I could see where they could just mix and match to whatever your feeling was at the time. If you want to learn a little bit more about this series, Ed and H.J. Welch have both been on the show within the past few months, and they each talk about their books and the series as a whole. You can hear Ed's interview in episode 249, and you can hear from H.J. in episode 254.
Whew, that's a lot of great reading, a lot of terrific stories. And if you're interested in learning more about the books that we've been discussing, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. All right, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Coming up on Monday in episode 283, we're going to be joined by Zoe and Kelsey from the Tea and Strumpets podcast. And we're going to be talking about, what else? Historical romance. I loved our conversation with them, learning a little bit more about what they like about historicals. And we even got to talk a little bit about Bridgerton, so it was a good time for sure. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay strong, be safe, and above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big A Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Our original theme music is composed by Daryl Banner. Thank you.